Welcome to the second of the MHI Vestas Offshore Visionary Debate Series in partnership with EWEA. Each day we are trying to give uh, people while they're sitting here having a bit of a bite to eat, we're trying to bring in some speakers from outside of the wind industry that can actually share their thoughts about topics in society and where we're heading. And we, as people in wind industry, we can think about this and maybe reflect on some of these ideas that are passed on and we can actually uh, maybe incorporate those into our lives as we move forward. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to invite Chris, Mark and Michael to the stage to kick off today's Visionary Debate Series. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Come on up, guys. We had a good talk yesterday about uh, urban issues uh, regarding, the, uh, regarding uh, energy. And today we're going to be talking about energy itself, which I think is uh, quite germane to, I guess, why we're, why we're all here. And it's very interesting that today, I will read a couple of headlines. Please, uh, Oliver, uh, yeah, yeah. Where'd you, Where'd you want? That's fine, right there, please, yeah. <laughs> that uh, we had a speech by uh, EU Vice President, European Commission Vice President Shevchovic, on the state of energy union. And it's already being critiqued. Uh, one of the headlines uh, is from uh, uh, Greenpeace. It's not uh, everybody's friend here, but Greenpeace criticized it, saying it's not surprising Shevchevich's head is full of nothing but gas, 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 because he's talking to the wrong people, he says, they say. All, also from Alde, the Liberal Democrats, in many areas, national governments are failing to deliver on their own agreed objectives, leaving Europe vulnerable to external pressures on our gas supplies and lagging behind on our climate change responsibilities. We'd like to talk about this from a political standpoint, from a market standpoint, uh, and from a consumer standpoint. And so with us today is Mark Oliver Betsuga from the Cologne Energy Economics Institute. He has a lot of very interesting studies on, on his website and Michael Wilshire, who is Director of Analysis at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. So to have both of them from the, uh, the analytical standpoint, and we'd also like to get you involved as well, as much as possible, uh, in this discussion. Um, I might uh, give a couple more uh, headlines that, uh, that I've gotten here. One is about, the, about storage. We'd like, to, we'd like to cover storage as well. And it's, it says that uh, researchers in Germany have developed a new renewable energy storage system capable of providing on-site storage for locally produced energy. Very interesting about locally produced energy. I think we'll, we'll be talking uh, uh, with Mark uh, about that. And another one is about the grid, that there is there's a new cable going between Spain and France that can transport enough electricity worth three nuclear power plants. Perhaps Michael could talk about that. Let's, let's open this up first to uh, uh, Mark, Mark and Michael. Um, what about this energy union? Do you, uh, do you think that, that Europe is taking the right direction with, with energy union uh, at the moment? Is this actually doable? Um, let's start with Mark. Well, I think the uh, European energy policy is uh is uh, shaped by a deep uh, ingrained paradox. And that paradox is, can be found in the Lisbon Treaty, Article 194, where at the same time the, the European Union pledges to build an integrated electricity and gas market, but at the very same time stresses that the sovereignty about the energy mix remains a, a national prerogative. And that's obviously uh, a paradox, because uh, Tech, in, in a market, especially in an internal market, technology choice and location choice uh, would be endogenous, i.e. shaped by market forces. Uh, and national governments would basically just watch the markets unfold in the larger European setting. So right. by, uh, by uh, trying to, to do both at the same time, uh, we can actually see in the field of energy policy uh, uh, the same kind of inconclusiveness between the national uh, 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 sovereignty issues and the claims of national governments to call the shots and the idea of European federalization. Okay, do you think, Michael, do, do you think it's really down to what the nation states decide, what the countries decide, and what the markets decide, Michael? Can we give Michael some sound? I think 
Can you give them, just give them the mic for now and we'll fix that. Okay. Sorry about that. It's on. It's on. I think a big part of it is down to... Mike, uh, okay. Is it on? Is that on? No. Okay. Uh, here we wait, go. Wait a minute. We're good. We're good. We, seem, we seem to be getting there. Okay. Um, I think a big part of it is down to uh, what's going on in the market. Um, governments um, at all levels can uh, set policy frameworks, and that's very helpful. Um, but what we see in terms of um, the markets that we look at and analyze is uh, a lot of it's being driven by economics. Um, so we've seen major reductions in the costs of um, both solar and wind. Um, just to give you a rough number, um, every time the, cost, the um, amount of solar that's been installed has, has doubled globally, we've seen costs fall by almost a quarter. Um, and for wind, the figure's uh, just under 20%. Actually, it's very high for wind as well. So you see the market really driving it in that direction, no matter what governments decide. I think that's a big part of it. I think we're talking about cost-competitive clean energy. You need a policy framework, and you need enough certainty about pricing uh, within that framework. But um, I think technology and cost improvements and experience uh, go a long way. How much does the grid matter in this situation? Um, let's, let, let's go to, let's go to uh, uh, Mark. What, how much is the grid important in this, in this uh, equation of trying to make sure that renewables become more and more competitive? Now, now for renewables, uh, the grid is the cheapest uh, option for flexibility and inc so for increasing flexibility and for especially for increasing metrological diversification. Um, and therefore, uh, with any with any renewable-based strategy, you need to think uh, uh, about expanding the grid. But I mean, you're talking about national grid, Europe grid, local grid. What kind of uh, grid? It, 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 this clearly depends on the level of penetration that uh, uh, the intermittent renewable energy already has in the in the system. With very low levels of penetration, so it's it's a smaller geographical scale, and the larger you want to have the penetration levels, the more important it becomes to get metrological diversification. And uh, if looking, looking at Europe, even Europe as a continent hasn't full metrological diversification, but at least much more than any national member state has on its own. Michael, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, certainly in relation to wind, grid, grid is clearly very important. Um, but we're also talking about a world in which energy, or at least some of the energy, is becoming much more decentralized, um, specifically solar. Um, right. We're expecting um, by 2040, um, distributed solar to be, well, solar in total will be about a quarter of the world's capacity. Right. Um, and uh, distributed solar at least half of that, possibly more. Um, so what you're talking about is something that's fundamentally a new technology that's more distributed in nature and therefore may need, may need less of a grid. So I think it's a story in two parts. You need more grid for some things. Distributed uh, technology actually helps. What, is, does anybody, would anybody like to uh, jump in here on this conversation about, about the grid? and about how important it is for renewables. Anybody? I think one, one issue regarding the grid is political resistance, isn't it? I mean, there are national interests that are, that are providing, that are uh, uh, posing a, uh, a barrier to that. Is, is that not true, uh, Mark? I think these motives are uh, explaining parts of the difficulties to uh, increase uh, the grid coverage. Um, but there are also uh, local acceptance issues in many, uh, in many places in Europe, um, uh, ranging, uh, ranging from, uh, uh, from ordinary households and people up to environmental movement, movements yeah. locally that are opposing um, the construction of grid. Uh, Michael, do you think, do you think the, how much is, is, is the politics uh, providing a barrier for the grid? Or do you, do you, do you, think, do you think it's so... Uh, logical market-wise that, that it's actually going to gather steam. I think it's interesting that in the past, between France and Spain, there was, there was resistance. And to have that new cable between France and Spain, I think, offers hope, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it's always, di um, you know, it's always a political issue if you're building grid, and particularly if it's environmentally unattractive or uh, people object to it. But we are seeing grid being built, um, you know, the example you mentioned and more broadly. Um, but I would say, um, when you get back to markets and uh, policies, there are some things you can do before you even get to building masses of grid. I'm not saying you don't need to build grid, um, but there are certain things you can do, uh, particularly when you're talking about balancing the system, 
before that. So things like um, demand response, uh, market-based mechanisms. You, you need the grid to get the power from one point to another. Um, but in terms of the flexible power that we're going to need on the new system, there are lots of different ways of doing that. And they don't all involve just building more grid or interconnection. OK, G Giles of EWEA, please let us know. What, what, how do you feel about this? Well, I was actually hoping to be able to ask a question rather than to give an opinion. OK, that's good. Chris. That's even better. <laughs> Thank you. My question to the two speakers is, where do you see the greater need for reform and investment? Is it in the transmission grid or the distribution grid? Very good question. Who starts here? Let's, let's go to Mark. Uh, both. Ah. You need both. It's an easy I mean, answer, uh, in particular, to, to, uh, to integrate the large uh, and, and growing shares of uh, solar, um, the distribution grid is uh, uh, particularly uh, concerned um, for making sure that you get a meteorological diversification um, uh, into play, which is particularly relevant uh, for the wind industry. You need larger, larger grid connections between, uh, between larger meteorological areas. So both. Okay. Uh, can, can I give a slightly please. different answer? I, I think I would say transmission um, as the, the first thing, uh, partly because um, if uh, you get more distributed solar, and particularly if, as in Australia, we, we see now, you get combinations of distributed um, solar plus storage, and the cost of storage is still too high for that to happen on a wide scale, but we're expecting them to fall quite rapidly. That may avoid some of the um, local distribution needs that you would otherwise, otherwise have. Um, so I, I would vote much more for transmission than distribution. Okay, what about the, what about the flexibility option? Isn't that part of the, the equation as well with the grid? Is, is the flexibility option of being able to have different sources of energy, right? Um, how does that yes. factor in? Yes, no, that, that's a very big factor because, you know, if you like, the new base load is not base load in the classic way we've, we've known it. It's, um, it's basically a set of power that may actually be very low cost to run, like wind and solar. Um, but uh, essentially is unpredictable. So there's going to be an increasing need for flexible power. Um, that's, that's very clear. There are lots of different ways of doing that. Um, the, the first thing to say is that software and um, you know, data is, is probably the cheapest option. So you should probably first think about, well, first of all, being very efficient mm. um, in terms of the grid. Um, secondly, what you can do in areas like demand response. Um, and there's a whole set of things you could go through. Thermal storage, by the way, would be another. That's probably underutilized in, in terms of uh, backing things up. Um, there are a lot of things you can do before you actually get to uh, needing to invest masses more uh, in addition to the large amounts that will already be needed in the grid. Um, and for that matter, storage. OK, so backup capacity, um, Mark, uh, gas also, or I mean, from what Shevchkovich uh, talked about today, I'm sure he's, that, that's got to be part of it, right? Well, I think it's, it's important to understand that in addition to any penetration level of uh, renewable wind and solar resources, you need the backup capacity. And in the foreseeable future, this backup capacity will be provided by thermal generators. And those thermal generators uh, are, are being with us now in, with an overcapacity, which, the, which is why prices are so low. And... Um, uh, over time, they might, uh, they might uh, develop in, uh, in, in terms of the mix. Uh, mm. You would expect that with increasing renewable shares, uh, you would increasingly see um, uh, gas-fired engines, so rather cheap backup capacity running only a few hours or a few hundred or thousand hours a year um, on gas. And this gas could, in the longer term, then actually become gas being produced by renewable energies. But that's obviously the very long-term scenario for okay. the thermal backup. While we're on grid, any other questions about the grid? I think that's a very, very important. That's a key issue. But also, storage is an issue. Storage is an issue. Um, where are we on that, uh, Michael? You, where is the market on storage? Because I think that, that's a very key issue. There's a lot of stores that we can do, but it's much too expensive at the moment, right? Yeah, the costs are high at the moment. I mean, we've all heard about the Tesla Powerwall. But, um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, in Australia, we are seeing combinations of PV and storage already. Um, but it is still um, too expensive to be a really mass market. So how do you overcome um, that? We're expecting how? that to come down, I was going to say, because okay. the, the cost, well, a big part of that actually is what happens on the electric vehicle market in relation to lithium-ion in particular, um, because it's all in economies of scale and learning curve game. 
Uh, and the more that he's built and the more experience you get, the more those costs will come down. Um, interestingly, we're, for electric vehicles, we're probably at about 250, 280 um, uh, pounds per kilowatt hour. Um, actually, if those factories that have already been built were run at full utilization, you see that come, come down quite a lot. Sorry, I should have said dollars, actually, um, per kilowatt hour. So you might see that come down to approaching $150 per kilowatt hour. Mm. Um, and I think the targets that people are talking about, about 100, are not outlandish anyway. It will take us a while to get there. So the answer is, is like all these other technologies, it's a very different cost curve. Uh, you're talking about, not about steel, you're talking about battery and chemistries and anodes and cathodes, and we do expect that, co that cost to come down substantially. Any, any questions on storage that you'd like to, or, or comments? I, I, yes, sir. Let's get a mic over there. Very key issue, obviously, for renewables. And if that can be solved, if that can be cracked, then, uh, then, then we've got, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you right after that. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm Theo Holton from Wind Farm Analytics. I'm okay. sorry to interrupt people's lunch, um, <laughs> but I must speak up about the cost of storage. Okay. You, you must be thinking of battery megawatts capacity installed. But if you would look at pumped hydro and analyze for a, an intelligently designed project, you will find that it will cost you uh, one or two pounds per megawatt hour delivered over the lifetime of the project. Very, very cheap, fast responding, 50 year lifetime. Uh, you know, we can dig our own reservoirs, top and bottom, can be deployed in many areas of Europe, maybe not uh, flat countries like Denmark so easily, unless you go underground. But certainly in Scotland, all you need is uh, 150 meters uh, head height for high efficiency, uh, 50 megawatt uh, reversible turbines. Thank you. Before I get reaction, how many in the audience here feel that storage are, how, how many are optimistic that we can, we can solve this storage problem in the next, uh, say, five years? How many people do you think we can solve the storage problem? That's very, very key for this industry. Uh, very much. Um, Michael, what do you think? That, how do you answer that? Yeah, no, it's, it's a fair point. I'm not saying um, in any way trying to compare the costs of um, lithium-ion battery with pump storage. Pump storage has it, um, clearly has its place in its uh, own cost structure. Uh, what I am saying is when you get to distributed storage, which is primarily um, the area where it would match very, very well um, distributed generation, um, you have to look at the costs in a slightly different measure. So one of the issues, with, um, particularly with solar power, is the costs are really coming down. When I started doing this job, which was about six years ago, um, it was about almost 10 times the cost that it is today, and that's, it's on a technology curve that isn't going to stop anytime soon. The, the, the issue is you can't use all the generation from solar that's being created, and you um, may in future not be able to export all that power profitably back to the grid. So that's why distributed storage is an important technology. You have to match it to the application. Okay, Mark, how do you feel about that? As, 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 you've, as, you, as you've seen, I haven't raised my hand. Uh, <laughs> we are consistently skeptical uh, yeah. around the role of st storage in the European electricity system. Um, consistently through the scenarios, we find storage playing a role only beyond, say, 2040, so with very high levels of renewable penetration and without expansion of the grid. And if you think about it, there's actually a, a pretty simple reason for, for this consistent finding. Storage is only one of many tools to supply flexibility. And within flexibility, you need to distinguish between the very short term, the short term, and the seasonal term. Now, the seasonal term is the most critical one. And we don't have a storage technology that is cost efficient for the foreseeable time for the seasonal storage, which means, as we said before, for the seasonal backup, mm. we will have thermal power plants sitting around anyway. Mm. So therefore, those thermal power plants can offer shorter term flexibility as well, especially if they are gas fired. So the need to have the seasonal backup capacity provides you with cheap sources of positive, of positive uh, flexibility. So you only have the issue of negative flexibility. So what do you do with excess electricity with high wind or high solar penetration? And then probably power to heat with the relatively quick consumption of the heat in the heat sector is more likely to happen than a, a sort of a, a, short, a storage system that takes the electricity, stores it somewhere, and brings it back to electricity. So that's we, our view on that. We have a question over here, sir. 
Hi there, uh, Andrew Ho from the European Wind Energy Association. Okay. So if we're talking about flexibility, what about flexibility of transmission, in particularly for uh, an interconnected offshore grid, let's say in the North Sea, a meshed grid design? Uh, I think we in the industry have heard about it for a while, but what are your views about that on, in terms of flexibility? Michael, what do you think? Um, I, th I think, yes, flexibility of transmission is um, cer certainly helpful. Um, I, I do think we're sort of painting a slightly too much of a dichotomy here because I think um, the reality is you need lots of different technologies and approaches to, to get there. Um, so um, I don't disagree with what Mark's saying about the need for more grid. Um, it's just that I think uh, if you're talking about balancing the system, at least at certain times of the year, there are a lot of other things you can do in advance which are very cheap. Um, so better forecasting uh, would be one, greater efficiency on, on the grid, to your point, making the grid uh, more, more effective. Um, demand response, I've mentioned, that's, that's another. Market-based mechanisms, we're seeing uh, market-based mechanisms being used for some of this reserve capacity and some of the um, very small capacity that Mark's talking about, um, you know, diesel gen sets of up to one megawatt. Uh, by the way, they can be highly distributed, so that flexible pack, uh, some of the flexible capacity that's going in is distributed as well, and that, uh, and part of the business case for it is it avoids uh, the need to invest quite as much as you otherwise would in the transmission system. And then you get to um, the need for more interconnection uh, and possibly the need for storage. So having said I'm long-term optimistic about storage, I wouldn't put it at the top of my list of things to do now, uh, but I do think it will play an important component in the future. Mark, how do you answer that question as well uh, on, on transmission? Well, as I, as I said, transmission, transmission is a flexibility option. That helps, you, that helps you to balance between meteorological conditions, which allows you to increase penetration levels. Um, and you face, uh, you face public acceptance issues in completing that. Uh, maybe adding to the storage point, I think it's important to see that, that solar re generates a very different pattern of flexibility needs and flex flexibility opportunities than wind does relative to the load. And so, uh, PV with battery, which allows to shift the, uh, the uh, consumption of the electricity by a couple of hours from the midterm solar peak to the evening consumption peak, might actually uh, be in the money rather quickly, especially as, as long as we have uh, household tariffs that are uh, distorted by uh, 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 sort of being kilowatt hour based rather than uh, 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 considering the time of use. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, one, one yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Do, sorry, I was just going to add to that. Um, one thing you can do and, and think about it is um, not just um, PV and wind in isolation, but how the two work together. So, um, because there's a system advantage in, in terms of diversity. Um, and a good example of where that's happening actually is China, where, you know, China, despite being the world's largest producer by, by far, of solar panels was relatively late into the game in terms of investing in solar, in terms of building the stuff um, for lo local, well, for distribution in, uh, generation in that country. Um, so it had a lot of wind five years ago and very little solar. Now it's roughly um, balanced between the two. And at a system level, that sort of approach is, is going to help. Another aspect we talked about was, uh, before was on uh, market predictability. I want to get to that. But uh, first, we have another question from you, sir. Thank you. Um, of course, uh, there are some advantages of batteries. Uh, uh, almost instant response, for instance, for very fast uh, frequency ancillary services. But uh, pumped hydro is so much cheaper and uh, on such a, a much greater scale. I mean, w when you've got the largest batteries, maybe some tens of megawatts for a few hours, we compare with, uh, you know, largest pump hydro schemes are thousands of megawatts for a number of days. Actually, it's easy to calculate that just one mountain valley can be dammed and a reservoir created top and bottom um, to deliver, for instance, 40 gigawatts, that's Britain's average demand roughly, for one week, just one valley. In Norway, you mentioned seasonal storage. Of course, this is a, a big uh, problem, especially when you consider heating as well as electricity. But the closest technology that will uh, go towards meeting this problem is indeed pumped hydro. Um, or in Norway, for instance, they have uh, simple hydro, one-way hydro, and they use that on a seasonal basis. Um, so uh, 
I think, um, yeah, I, I really think that uh, pumped hydro is the key. And um, while transmission line upgrades can be useful, um, if you want to, if you want to fully utilise, no, if you want to fully utilise your uh, lines when there are, for instance, in uh, Scotland or maybe in Texas, large wind capacities on the end of long, long transmission lines, uh, much better to co-locate energy storage with those uh, renewable generators. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, would you like to briefly comment on that? If there are uh, any other questions, actually, please. I, 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 I wouldn't see the contradiction that you, that you propose because uh, pumped hydro is, of course, a flexibility option that is well known and uh, much used. Um, it's particularly useful in the, in the, in the short, uh, uh, shorter term, um, given sort of the uh, relatively uh, a, a low am amount of storage capacity that you have in those, in those in install uh, installments. But the point is that with renewable energies, which by nature do not have a large energy density, you will need to bring the electricity to the pumped hydro storage because the electricity will be generated at a distributed level. So in order to have a system uh, uh, in which pumped hydro plays an even larger role than it already does today, you would need grid um, in, order, in order to collect the renewable electricity and bring it to, to the point. For the solar, for solar and battery, that's actually the main difference. You can shift the midday solar peak to the evening demand peak in a household without resorting to grid expansion, bringing it to a pumped hydro station, bringing it back to the household, mm. just by using the battery in the household. Well, if you, and then the, the, you are saying it is more expensive, uh, the question is, uh, A, is it more expensive in an integrated perspective? Mm. And B, even if it were less expensive, assuming that people allow grids to be built without being compensated, which is the assumption in most of the grid projects, um, would people uh, accept grid expansion? And so if you don't have fast grid expansion and to integrate large amounts of uh, PV, you would need to integrate both the distribution grid, you expand both distribution and transmission. Uh, without this, probably the battery will be the faster option to the market uh, rather than the grid for the PV, not for the wind. The wind is different. So I'm sure it's, it, it's got to be a mix of different kinds of storage then, in other words, right? Um, uh, but for, but I'd like to get to market uh, predictability, but um, did you have any other, any more to comment on that, Michael? J just, just a very brief one. I, I don't think it's either or. So, um, and, and first of all, I, I, did, I did again say I would put storage, you know, towards the end of my list of things to do before I'd done the simple things first. Um, but I think you have to think about the application. So no battery is going to help you with seasonal variations, I mean, clearly. Um, pumped hydro will help you with that. So I think you've got to look at what the application is. If you're looking at something where you're trying to move seasonal demand, that's one thing. If you're looking at something where you're trying to shift by an hour or two in the day that, um, on a distributed level, that's another. And, and by the way, all the manufacturers of storage that I've spoken to say it's very important to tap into multiple revenue streams. Um, so even for them, you know, they're looking at if you deploy solar, how can you, uh, sto sorry, storage and solar, how can you tap into, for example, some of the very short-term frequency balancing markets as well as the, you know, one-hour shifting. And that's the way you make the economics work uh, fastest, by making uh, any storage that you build um, satisfy as many of those different markets as you can. And they, they can operate... Um, you can sort of have your cake and eat it. You can have more than one market at a time because when you're using the storage may be different according to the application. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have 15 minutes left. So please get in your questions before then. I think we have some good ones here and some good uh, comments as well if you'd like to make a comment. Uh, let's, let's move to uh, market predictability. And we've discussed that too in the past about, um, I mean, how can you give more predictability for an industry to want to build the capacity. And, and, and there is the argument that maybe there should be uh, either some sort of government-insured way to do this, or I think we were talking about auctions like in the UK. Michael. Yeah, I, th I think what's happened is we've moved from a world of um, price certainty, at least um, except in countries where there was retroactive action through um, feed-in tariffs, where 
essentially you not only got a subsidy, but you also knew the price in advance. And knowing the price in advance is really, really important. Now, the feed-in feed uh, tariffs, though, have, have lost their political support up to now, right? There, there's no for feed-in right. tariffs, right? Feed-in feed tariffs, and I think uh, a world where there's going to be very strong subsidy um, support, with the exception of offshore wind, um, you know, that, that is now, you know, moving away from us. And the reason for that is policymakers are looking at it and saying, why do we need to subsidize something that's, uh, in many cases, cost-effective or on the verge of becoming cost-effective in other places. So I'm not saying subsidies completely, the need for them goes away, but they are intended to reduce over, t over time. Uh, what you still need, even if you're in a relatively subsidy-free world, is um, price certainty. And yep. uh, the problem you've got is that if you build renewable capacity, it's zero marginal cost to run it, uh, and therefore, uh, and we're already seeing this effect on wholesale prices, the uh, the market price um, may be very low uh, unless you've got a long-term contract. Um, so we're seeing, um, you mentioned it, auctions, um, where you've essentially got a market test on what the price paid should be. Um, but the, um, one, once that market test has been applied, uh, then you've got certainty of, of that price. Um, so we saw that first in uh, countries like Brazil, where essentially you bid for the price that you were prepared to operate at. Uh, we're seeing it in markets um, such as the contract for difference markets in the UK, uh, assuming there is another one um, that effectively give you a guarantee of price. So I do, th I do th and actually we're also seeing it with corporations who are in some cases willing to sign long-term contracts because it gives them uh, certainty over the price that they'll have in, in, into the future. So I think we'll, we'll see more you know, experimentation. It's a very important area. And even that is, that, that's independent of any government action. That's, that's just happening anyway uh, within, within businesses, within uh, power providers and power consumers. Yes, right? although governments can help by creating the markets, creating the auctions, creating the price certainty. Um, by essentially saying, you know, there may not be a subsidy or m not much of, as much of a subsidy in here, but yeah. you will get price certainty. So a contract for difference arrangement does give you that. That's just one example. Mark, Mark there's, there's still feed-in tariffs in Germany, correct? I mean, that, that is, isn't that part of the Energiewende in Germany, the Nuclear Ausstieg? And, and so what's the viability of that now? Do you think there's, that's going to continue in Germany as a, as a model for other countries? Or do you see more of the model along the lines of, of what Michael was talking about through the private sector? Well, we, we already see a, a transition in Germany from the traditional feed-in tariff uh, to, a, uh, to an auctioned uh, system. Uh, there have been uh, the first auctions uh, with PV, and uh, uh, this is supposed to be then the model for the future. However, th the difference between those two models in terms of price certainty isn't that big because the the only difference is that the kilowatt hour uh, the kilowatt hour uh, price remuneration is being made endogenous rather than be, being exogenous as in the classic uh, in the classic feed-in tariff. Can um, you explain that endogenous exogenous? Uh, well, uh, uh, in the old system, the state just defined uh, what is the price that the kilowatt hour gets, mm. uh, independent of the time of production, okay. and now it's an auction that determines the kilowatt hour price that uh, is remunerated independent of the time of production. Now the next step in that development obviously would be to make the kilowatt hour subsidy a kilowatt subsidy and expose the investors to the fluctuation in the electricity price. So shift the price risk from the consumer to the renewable investor. That would be the, a greater step in terms of uh, reducing price certainty for the renewable investor than the current auctioning scheme. Uh, you're asking uh, sort of for the perspective. Currently, I'd say uh, uh, the German uh, 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 determination to hand out uh, subsidies on a kilowatt hour basis to uh, and thereby give um, a high uh, re uh, certainty, price certainty to renewable investors is unbroken. However, politically, you can expect that uh, since the cost of doing so is increasing dramatically in our country, uh, that policymakers uh, of the next government, which will be elected in 2017, will be faced with the question how to shift some of the, reduce some of this cost or find new way of refinancing. Because refinancing it solely through the electricity consumer generates all sorts of problems. Uh, in particular, it creates the problem that electricity is discriminated relative to other sources of energy. Do we think that maybe um, after Paris, after the climate talks, when they reach 
this agreement supposedly to, to slash CO2, would that not create the political atmosphere and the political uh, landscape uh, to justify feed-in tariffs at that point? Michael. I, I think the chance of feed-in tariffs coming back in a big way is actually quite, quite low because feed-in tariffs have a lot of uh, problems. One, one, one is that we haven't spoken about is it's when you've got technology costs moving very fast, it's actually quite hard for policymakers to adjust the feed-in tariffs sufficiently rapidly uh, to get the right level of incentives. So we've had periods where feed-in tariffs may have been a bit, a bit too low and um, not much has happened, and feed-in tariffs have then gone up and people have rushed in. Uh, so you tend to get a more, more of a stop-go environment. You actually see that, by the way, very strongly in the US market. They don't have feed-in tariffs there, um, but they have, um, they have schemes that effectively have a cut-off date, and there's a lot of uncertainty about whether that will be renewed. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, so I think stability of policy um, is incredibly important in, in terms of giving people a framework within, within which to plan. Mark, you've said that the political, political economy is, is, is a very important factor in all of this. So do you think that there will be uh, a chance for uh, feed-in tariffs after this Paris Agreement? I, 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 I wouldn't expect so, because in most countries where you would expect this to happen, it had already happened, right? Yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't expect a big push. P plus, what you said is absolutely right. The tendency is to move away from feed-in tariffs for all the problems that... That, that, you, that you mentioned, and to go to auctioning. Also, the European Union is asking for auctioning. Mm. Um, and then the question is, is it kilowatt hour auctioning or kilowatt auctioning, which is a difference from the time perspective of the investor. Now, the, I think from the political economy perspective, the most interesting question over the next two or three years around this issue of, uh, uh, of, of, of price certainty in European renewables is whether or not the transition towards an auctioning scheme actually opens up the national renewable markets to European competition, because it's a, slow, it's, 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 it's a very small step to say, okay, now here's an auction mm -hmm. in a country like Germany, and now I'm a Dutch landowner, and I want to build um, a wind farm in the Netherlands and apply for the German auction. And in a European internal market, it's actually very hard to argue why this should be forbidden. Yeah. Now, but once this is allowed, this would mean that the German electricity consumer is no longer subsidizing German landowners, but we're subsidizing, would be subsidizing a Dutch landowner. And the Dutch landowner is not part of the electorate of the German government. So therefore, sort of the transition to auctioning creates this situation where the entire political economy of the renewable support schemes in the various European countries might actually uh, come into question due to this Europeanization, which doesn't have a political support on the European level. We've got five minutes left in our lunchtime debate today, the MHI Vestas debate. Uh, any other questions at this point? I think there's one last question that, that we did discuss also in the past is, is the question of decentralization and where to generate this power, do you generate in the industrial centers, or you know that sometimes that's not possible for, for wind energy anyway? Um, how are you going to decentralize power generation so that it, it's provided for the industries that need it? Michael, I think I think we may have different views on this. Um, okay. <laughs> my, my view is that um, where whereas in the past we we tended to concentrate generation more in the, um, for example, in the industrial centers. Um, we're now moving to, first of all, we have um, different economies. They're much more service-based um, in terms of where energy is needed. Right. Um, and decentralized power, we see it being deployed by all sorts of um, uh, segments, including actually, very importantly, corporations. So, uh, for example, retailers would be one, data centers is another. And they're looking at distributed um, generation as a means of getting electricity more cost effectively for their needs. So I think uh, one of the advantages of decentralized generation is you can, for some industries, locate it very close to the point of where it's needed. And, and also you see other um, off-grid markets, for example, like mining in, in parts of the world where uh, decentralized, decentralized ge generation works very, very well. And decentralization then from a, from a bilateral standpoint then, I guess, between the generators and the consumers, not, yeah. not a And one, one other policy. thing about decentralized generation uh, or decentralization in general is I think it creates more competition because it creates, um, it re reduces the barriers of, to entry for entering because in some cases you don't need 
all the network, or you may not need a network at all for some applications. Um, so, you know, if you look at um, the amount of competition you've got in terms of who's providing solar in the US, you've got Solar City doing it. Um, in terms of deals that are being struck between uh, providers of solar and corporations, it, there's much more consumer and customer choice already. Um, and I think that will accelerate as a result of this. So I think we should um, bear in mind decentralization. We've seen it in other industries like uh, telecoms. It created a whole wave of competition and innovation. Um, so for that reason, I think it's, it's not the only thing, but I think it's a good thing. And Mark, how much hope do you have that, that decentralization in this sense uh, could be uh, a great opportunity for renewables like wind? Well, first of all, I think that decentralization is, uh, is a difficult term. Um, most people interpret it from the perspective of, OK, there's a household. And in the past, the household was far away from the, from the power plant. And so having the generation now on site with a PV station, now we are more decentral than in the past. Whereas if you think of an industrial company that had a production facility sitting right next to a large thermal plant, you would say, oh, the large thermal plant was actually decentral to the large industrial plant. And so um, my view is that, yes, liberalization has opened up the market and has in particular allowed many different generation options to come up. And yes, distributed generation will take a larger share. Um, still, just thinking in pure energy densities, so what per square meter in production and in consumption, you can clearly see that, say, households are roughly, have roughly the same energy density as solar um, uh, has. So you might imagine a world where houses are more or less provided by solar, even, even in these regions, with battery and some backup. A large industrial facility or a large city, a densely populated city, has energy densities in demand that no renewable technology could offer at the same in, the, in the same order of magnitude of space. So, so you would always need much more space in order to come up with the energy to be provided there, and you would have to find a way to scale up the density. And therefore, I, 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 I strongly think that for a foreseeable future, we will have um, an increase of distributed generation, in particular for the households and the small industrial and commercial enterprises, while still having the need to have large capacities uh, and large transmission grids in order to make sure mm. that our industrial and, and civic centers can be uh, sufficiently supplied with energy. And the more wind we are using in this, particularly wind offshore, the more grid we obviously need. And if we don't use grid to transport the energy, we need gas and generate gas and transport the gas to the uh, consumption centers. That's so quite a holistic look at the situation. I think it was good to have uh, a, a bit of point counterpoint today between uh, uh, Mark Oliver Betzerga, professor at the Cologne Energy Economics Institute, and Michael Wilshire, uh, director of analysis at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank them, and I'd like to thank you for coming as well. I'd like to thank MHI Vestas for, uh, for uh, uh, setting up this for us and allowing us to have this discussion. Tomorrow we're going to continue with the issue of business and climate change, obviously with the, with Paris, uh, the Paris uh, Climate Summit in mind. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, try to check out this Oculus Rift. It's pretty awesome. You have this sensation of being on top of a wind turbine. I'm Chris Burns, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.